Thanks so much for being here with us to talk about your picture, um, which feels incredibly timely, um, you know, given that we're living in a world where the awareness, at least, of uh, the refugee crisis um, caused by so much war and strife in the world is, is apparent and, and so visceral. It's just more apparent now, perhaps, than other times it's always been there for us. But I imagine you didn't set up to make a topical film when you uh, started uh, to tell this story. Is that true? Or, or how aware were you that this might feel very urgent uh, for when the time it, it came out? Uh, well, I started writing this 10 years ago. Um, and I think the research for this started more than 15 years ago. So at that time, child soldiers specifically was much more of a topic, much more of a headline in newspapers and, and whatnot. And that sort of faded by the time we were about to make this movie. Uh, but that doesn't mean the uh, relevancy of it hasn't changed. Maybe it's not as much a forefront in terms of like social action. Um, obviously, the Coney thing in 2012 created a Facebook stir, but other than that, like, uh, people haven't really been involved in, in necessarily creating awareness about child soldiers, and uh, I think most recently the number is around 350,000 child combatants, and that doesn't include the children who are sort of affected directly by the violence in, in uh, conflict areas. But um, I think I just set out to make a movie about something that emotionally affected me when I first learned about it. And unfortunately, 20 years later, it's still relevant. And just a, a small follow-up on that, well, not small necessarily, but um, you know, it, it takes on a different political edge, perhaps, because of the, the, you know, the awareness factor now. And I'm just wondering how, if you, if you feel pulled in that direction to take a political kind of stand in what, as a storyteller, wouldn't necessarily be a, a motive for you to, to tell this story. Um, I don't know if it's much as politics as it is, you know, humanism. You know, uh, I made Sin Nombre almost eight years ago, and that was started off a short film that I made about uh, a group of immigrants that were abandoned in a refrigerated trailer in Victoria, Texas in 2003. And that's when I first wrote that short. And then as recently as this summer, there was a group of immigrants abandoned in Austria in a refrigerated trailer. So, uh, uh, these things that, that affect us, if we're sort of, if our focus is or our, our, our sensitivity is, a, is sort of attuned to things that are happening in the world around us, and not necessarily just the drama of our own lives, uh, uh, the, there is no sort of uh, uh, expiration date to these kinds of things, and therefore the politics of it aren't really relevant, because it's not about elections or anything else, it's just about uh, how humans are being treated or how, what humans are going through around the planet, around us. So um, this is an adaptation uh, of a novel uh, by Uzo Dinma Iwela. Close? Iwala. Iwala, thank you. Uh, a novel about child soldiers. Um, this is, you, you wrote the screenplay. Um, I, I just want to ask you about um, any influences that you may have had um, beyond the novel, either cinematically or otherwise, before I leap in with, with what is drawn to me, but uh, just any influences you may have had? Uh. Um, just given the journey that uh, Agu's character goes through, uh, the book is written non-linear, but you're able to sort of track uh, where he's at emotionally, and his perception, I, I think, of his experience is quite strong in the book. Um, I, I made it linear in my first draft uh, because I felt like it'd be easier in, in the film world the, to track it that way. But I think the film for me that sort of made, was the easiest or closest comparison just because of the change he goes through was uh, Empire of the Sun, J.G. Ballard's sort of autobiography. It, it was his experience, you know, being a prisoner of war during World War II and, uh, and Spielberg's adaptation of it, which I felt as a kid, I was almost the same age as Christian Bale mm -hmm. uh, when that movie came out. And uh, I just remember being so affected by seeing not only his experience, but experiencing uh, also emotionally his change from being the spoiled, privileged child to this uh, somehow uh, before his time adult. And even by the end, his parents being unable to recognize him. And I think for Agu, he's, he becomes this other being by the end. And would his mother ever recognize him? I think that is the question mark. So um, I'll bring up uh, the one uh, 
thing that came to my mind when I was seeing it, and I know it's it's not an original thought. Um, I've I've read a little bit about it, but it's it's Conrad Joseph Conrad, and um, for me, um, the idea of Idris Elba, uh, Elba's character kind of being Kurtz before Kurtz, right? Like what what was uh, a Colonel Kurtz in in the case of of Apocalypse Now, or Kurtz uh, in terms of um, Heart Heart of Darkness? Um, what what did he do? What was what was he before he became that character? And I'm just wondering if Conrad or, or Coppola had any, uh, came into mind at all when you were making this. I, I think it's impossible to avoid <laughs> comparing the experience of uh, shooting in the jungle or making a film about experience that goes deep into the heart of the jungle uh, and especially in the heart of conflict uh, without thinking about Conrad and the heart of darkness. Um, and Definitely Apocalypse Now was a movie that was on our minds uh, as we were shooting and mainly because we wished we had as much time as they had to shoot. Uh, but um, uh, there is something, and I, I noticed this when I used to travel after college uh, about expatriates living in countries, especially in countries in conflict. Uh, there's a separation from the normal, the separation from your normal society that uh, removes you from normal judgment that allows for you to act in ways that you normally wouldn't act. And I think warfare also allows us to sort of explore our darker demons. And uh, uh, I think what Conrad was describing is something that he probably also observed in the same way that Graham Greene also observed many of the same things uh, of people separated from um, uh, normal self-policing of, of actions and moral actions specifically and falling into uh, uh, rationalizing decisions based on some greater you know, end. So you mentioned um, time to make the film. I, I wanted to dig into, you wear how many hats in this film? Director, writer, uh, cinematographer, shooter in some cases? I mean, Operator, yeah, yeah. Operator, yeah. Um, was that all uh, a question of means or was it also strategic on your part to really kind of um, own I was trying to save us money in the production. I wasn't being paid for all those parts. Uh, um, I, I, well, I wrote it many years ago and planning on directing it. The, the producing, producing part came later as I kind of got more uh, products under my belt to be able to say like I want to be in, in that role to be able to sort of decide how money is spent and how much money we spend, period. And then also the cinematography, I started off in cinematography before film school and I worked as a, as a camera operator on documentaries all through film school and afterwards. And uh, um, I love cinematography and, and, and uh, um, had always wanted to try shooting one of my own films and none of them really felt like, I, I sort of felt like I needed to first figure out what my job was directing before I jumped into doing cinematography. And after doing True Detective, I thought anything after that would be so much easier. Uh, and it turned out this wasn't the case. But um, I jumped on to do cinematography on this one. I had not planned on operating, but our operator pulled his hamstring on our first day of shooting. Um, first setup, second take. So after that, if we wanted to move the camera, I was moving the camera. So. And I, it just means you guys gotta really uh, warm up and and stretch. <laughs> Don't stretch before warming up though either, because that's more harm than good. I, and I take it you'd never shot a film in Africa before. I mean, everything about it was, was new. I, actually, I had. Oh, you I, had? <laughs> I, uh, I operated a documentary in Guinea, which is how I went to Sierra Leone originally for research in Got 2003. It. Okay. And then I did another short uh, with Darren Liu, and we kind of co-DP'd this short in 2012 in Kenya. So it was my third time shooting in Africa. Got it. But um, first time shooting in Ghana. So um, we have to talk about Abraham Atta who played Agu in this film. Just remarkable, and someone I'm sure we will be seeing much more of. It seems like he's interested in acting more, but give us a little uh, backstory on, on him and, and uh, how you convinced him. <laughs> so Abraham, uh, first of all, we, once we decided we were shooting in Ghana, uh, we knew that we didn't have money to bring in cast from uh, other places, uh, Idris Elba, was going to be our main sort of um, outside cast. We ended up getting enough money to bring in 2IC and uh, um, Dada Goodblood characters. But otherwise, everyone else was cast from Ghana and a couple from Nigeria. 
And uh, we learned pretty quickly, there is a film infrastructure there, there's a film world in Ghana. It's just, they'll make a feature in three days. It's a, just a very different style of making movies. And there's a pool of actors to, that we were able to draw from and we did cast from that world as well. But we knew for this, these, all these kids we were casting that we were gonna have to, to, to reach further into the community. And um, our initial open casting calls were complete failures, so just no one came. And um, I think partially it's because no one can come. If they're in school, they're in school, and if they're not in school, they're working or trying to get jobs. So we ended up having to go out into the community, civic centers, churches, football pitches, anywhere we can go where kids might gather and try to scout them. And that's actually where we found Abraham, uh, uh, Harrison Nesbitt, the casting director, uh, went to this football pitch in uh, uh, Ashaiman, which is a, a rough neighborhood in Accra. And um, uh, uh, I, the kids noticed that it was a white man watching them. And so they assumed it was a football scout. When I say football, I mean soccer, soccer scout. Yeah. And uh, uh, so when he went up to talk to them, they're like, we're being scouted for soccer. This is a big deal. Yeah. And then he's like, this is God, actually, good. yeah, they're like, this is actually for a movie. And there's a little disappointment. Uh, <laughs> But um, Abraham ended up coming to uh, an open audition then at that point, and uh, his friends sort of helped convince him to go. And it was good because basically, I, my original intent was, we, we were in Ghana 10 months before starting shooting, um, was to get a scout in there early, start finding people, fill up a sort of theater group of kids, and give them all the tools necessary for a couple months before we start shooting so that it would make all our lives much easier and, and these kids would know what they're doing. In the end, uh, Harrison only got to Ghana eight weeks before we started shooting, and he had s six weeks, basically, really, to cast everyone, which was 40 speaking parts and 300 non-speaking parts, and uh, he had to um, get all these kids, and then once we got the kids, we had to be able to give them some rudimentary uh, training. So Zoe Martinson, who is a, uh, a young theater director in New York, who'd also done theater work in Ghana, uh, came out, and she helped sort of with the sort of theater school and also coaching them to get them ready. And Abraham basically had two weeks of uh, rehearsal to like, you know, it, it, and still hadn't been cast yet, but two weeks of rehearsal to sort of like say, hey, all right, this is what I got to deliver to potentially be Agu. And by no means that I think like he was like, he, he, he was the, like, how do I say this? I just wasn't sure. <laughs> but at that point we had no more time. So he was our best bet. Right. And, and, and the first day of shooting, I remember asking him like, do you know what's going on here in this scene? He's like, Okay, this is what's going on. Do you get it now? What was the what was the first scene? Uh, we we shot mainly in order, but the first day we shot him running away from his village, yeah. so it was a little bit out of order. And that was the day that the operator pulled his hamstring because when we told Abraham to run, he ran, and the camera operator was like, Clemens, he's you know, he's on the other side of fifty, he's sixty, and he needed to stretch. Didn't stretch. <laughs> totally taking a no. Um, but I'll, I will say about Abraham, and, he was, and what I noticed about him in the theater workshops was that he was an observer, mm -hmm. and he had a lot going on in his eyes, in the sense, I don't know if there was a lot really going on there, but it seemed like there was a lot of internal things going on, so at least the camera would think a lot's going He's on. He's an actor, there. it doesn't matter. It doesn't it's matter. Long, yeah. And, um, uh, what it turned out to be was that he's, 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 a, he's a sponge, he's a smart kid, and you know, he, he, got, he understood really quickly whose job it was what on set, and he also learned really quickly uh, what it meant when we're going again, which was either it was his fault or somebody else's fault. And by the time we got to um, the long take, where he has to stomp on the girl and I consider mercy kill that woman, uh, it's all on him. So as we were going again, and if he had delivered, he knew it was one of the other kids that had messed up, he'd be like, I need you to pay attention. Like he was owning it he was by that point. Yeah, yeah, he knew it. He knew we were running up those stairs and going around that entire house and he was gonna have to like, and he, he, that whole scene is on his shoulders. You know, the camera's just following him. I mean, and that, that obviously brings up the um, uh, visceral intensity uh, of the picture and how did you prepare him and the other actors for that? I mean, I know it's acting and, and you know, going through it, but at the same time, um, there's both the reality of the story, which um, I, was he, how cognizant of, was he of, of that situation, 
and then in the context of, of filming it, um, how easy was it for them to let go as actors of, of the reality of what may have happened? Uh, prior to shooting, most of these kids, and I would say for most of the people from his neighborhoods or who are less educated, uh, don't know anything about these wars that were happening in Liberia or Sierra Leone or Cote d'Ivoire. They just, they just don't watch the news, they don't know about it. So there was an education on that sense about what these wars are like. Um, and then once we're actually doing it, you know, it's quite clinical. Like you, you have a shot here. It's ma it was mainly one camera shooting. So there's a shot here, then a shot here. It's very repetitive. You have a, a, a stunt coordinator dealing with some of the more violent scenes like when he has the machete, that soldier. And so uh, it's not as, I think, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like traumatizing as it might come off once it's cut together with sound design and everything else. Uh, because it's it's between takes, people are goofing off, or someone's doing something, and people laugh, and then we get back into it. Because you have to laugh when it's things released, are so yeah. tense. Everyone's keeping it light in between takes, um, and so I, in that sense, I think that they weren't necessarily uh, traumatized by the experience. If, if anything, I think the kids, for the most part, it was like being at camp and playing war most of the time. And was there resistance at all then in, in Ghana specifically to shooting this film or you know, were people aware of the, the fact that you were shooting a, a story about a different part of Africa that, that had this experience and don't pin this on us kind of thing or, or were, were people generally embracing of, of the fact that there was you know, a, an important movie being shot? There? Anyone here from Ghana? Just checking. Uh, no, it's, it, Ghana is a, a very peaceful country, and partially peaceful because it's very controlled, uh, more so than the, the states around it. And so there's a lot of bureaucracy there and a lot of reviewing what we were doing. So the military, every level of the government knew the subject of the story, the content of it, and the, the general sort of thesis of it. And so uh, uh, it was, it, we had to be very clear that it wasn't Ghana despite the kids speaking in, in Tree in the beginning. Um, and uh, um, they were very helpful. Uh, I think Ghana sees the, uh, uh, if more film productions go there, it's very good for Ghana. Um, so there was the sort of a little bit of trailblazing there to see you know, if, if it's a viable place to shoot, and it absolutely was um, difficult, but like, that's just because we're the pioneers in that sense in terms of an outside production. But um, I think they were ultimately very helpful. And I think uh, we couldn't have done it without the support of the military and the support of many different uh, ministries within the government. But like politically or, or socially, it wasn't like... Um, we didn't want to get involved in the politics. And then the politics are already in any country, including... I, I, we didn't want to get the involved in the politics here. You know what I mean? It's Not today. So um, just... Uh, one question about the, the context of, of how this film was put out, um, other than novelty, um, it seems to me quite a different uh, experience to watch this film collectively in a cinematic experience um, as um, the audience did tonight versus um, having uh, the experience or the intimate experience of, of watching it at home or on a device. Um, and that has also to do with just the, the kind of ability to turn away or turn off, um, which in some ways uh, an intense f picture like this um, invites perhaps if you're not there with others. And so I just wondered how conscious of you might, w may have been in uh, knowing that you know, this was also uh, a, a trailblazing picture in terms of the way it was gonna be seen or experienced by audiences. Do you have a preference even? I, I'm very happy you guys saw the movie this way. Um, I think even, I'm assuming if you're here, you enjoyed it enough to, to hear me talk about it afterwards. But um, it, I know even me, if I was separating myself from the movie, if I was just a viewer of it, had I watched it at home, I wouldn't have the same experience that you guys had here. And that's not just because of the screen size, which helps, or the, the sound, but I think it's the, the being around other people and that sort of collective emotional experience. I, I can walk into a cinema at the end of a screening and know whether the audience is like emotional or not just based on the feeling in the room. And that's not like a, a special skill, it's just you can feel it, everyone here can feel it. Um, and that works for comedies as much as it does for horror films. Uh, it's just, 
I think we enjoy these things much more as a group. Uh, it probably goes back to our original sort of like around the campfire sort of wiring. But um, I couldn't deny also the power of Netflix supporting the film in 65 million homes around the world. And what that would mean for a film that could have very easily been lost amongst all the other wonderful indie films that come out with very limited releases and no one talks about them. I really like the, the image of um, this being a story that's uh, told around a, a fireplace or a, a fire pit or, uh, because it is set in a nondescript um, locate, you know, it, it is, there is a universality uh, about that um, effect and so in a, in a way hopefully that is, is more possible by not making it super specific. Do you have time for a question or two from the audience? Oh, great. Uh, yes. So there, the question was about more side titles, uh, perhaps for the English dialogue, is that what you were saying? Um, I didn't really think about it. I, I, th I think you get the, the intention, and not every word is, for me this is not necessarily like theater, in the sense where the meaning of every word drives direction, what's going on, I think the emotion comes through. And I think if I would have had subtitles too often, it'd, I would have to do subtitles for everything. And then I think that'd be ultimately distracting. I'd rather just you watch their faces. Yeah, right in the middle, sir. I think I could answer the first one because it'll be hard for him to say no to <laughs> directing another feature, but you probably will. Oh, shoot. Like, literally shoot. Oh, I thought you were asking if I'd direct another film. <laughs> I think. I'm just kidding, yeah. No. <laughs> The question is what I do directing or shooting again. Uh, I think it depends on the project. Uh, I really love the cinematographers that I collaborate with, and I think that there's times when I, when I don't want to take on everything, and there's other times, I think, especially when I'm working with non-actors, maybe it's more when I might do it again, uh, just to have that intimacy. Um, what was the other part of your question? Uh, what's the most difficult sequence to film? The most difficult sequence to film. Um, I, I think just because of logistics, the ambush of the convoy was pretty difficult because we were shooting in the rainy season. And uh, as opposed to like, for example, when we shot New Orleans for True Detective, uh, it was pretty inclement, but I was able to look at my radar and see if a rainstorm was gonna be four hours or 20 minutes. And in Ghana, we couldn't do that. So King Lou, our AD, our local AD, would be like, King Lou, is that a, 20 minute cloud or an all day cloud? And King would be like, oh, I think that might be an all day cloud. And then we're like, okay, we're in this convoy location, really can't go anywhere else, so what do we shoot? So we shot like, for example, the scene of them underneath the truck having that conversation during a long rainstorm because that actually didn't take place there. It was took place someplace completely different. But I ended up just rearranging the script so it, it took place there because we had nothing else to shoot but it'd be sunny and then cloudy and then rainy and we'd be sweeping out the road because it, it was like rivers on the road and we were supposed to shoot that in two days and it took four days to shoot. So, and we lost two whole days of shooting on that, on that location. So that was pretty tough because then I had to cut two days out of shooting elsewhere just to get that one. So maybe I'll just uh, follow up with the last question uh, on that uh, note. Do you... Can you give us any hints? I know you're, you're going to be on the, the circuit um, helping share this picture with uh, folks, hopefully all the way up to um, the big awards uh, at, in the new year, but any hints on next projects? For all your fans out there, I know you've got, that's why they're all here. Well, everyone's leaving. I just also just want to thank you guys again for staying. Um, uh, um, and thank you for seeing it on the big screen. Um, next, uh, right now, it's back to the small screen for a little bit. Uh, I'm working on a TNT Paramount project, which is an adaptation of Caleb Carr's The Alienist, uh, which is about 1890s New York, which is like my favorite time period in New York. Uh, I won't direct the whole thing, though, but I'm, I'm working every day with the writers to like put together the screenplay, and hopefully it'll be a, a good show. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Congratulations. Congratulations.